I'm here with Taylor Remus. She is um, a student here at St. John. And Taylor, I think I've known you since you were like four years old, I believe. Yeah, just about. Mm -hmm. But tell us about yourself. I'm currently a junior at Lafayette High School. And I have been involved at St. John since, yes, I was four. I went to school here and we've been involved in the church. I grew up here, I was baptized here. I serve with the three and four year olds and then uh, once a month I'll do the kindergarten through fourth grade large group. Well, Steve Wheeler came to me way back when, when I was in fifth grade here and it was the kickoff of Family Live and he really wanted me to get involved on the dance team and the singing team so he had me come down. And I started doing that, and then I got involved in Studio Jam, and you and Steve interviewed me and had like a little audition. And then I got into Studio Jam, and that's where it started. I have a really big heart for kids. They hold a special place. They want to learn, and I want to be their teacher. So it was when he came to me, I was totally on board, and it's a fun way to do it. I have talents that I want to use, so acting and singing and dancing is fun, and doing it with kids is even better. I'm not one to just put myself out there, and jump in. I like someone to hold my hand, and Steve did a really good job about that. He really gets down with his volunteers, and he's organized, and he wants you know, you to have a relationship with him, and he shows you how to have a relationship with the kids. But learning those kid Bible stories has brought me closer to God. I've learned it from their you know, point of view. I don't remember what I learned three and four, so learning it from their point of view is pretty cool. And it just shows me that they can love Jesus just as much as a 16-year-old, a 40-year-old, a 50-year-old. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have big hearts, too. <laughs> you care for someone and take time for someone, they can really succeed and learn. And, you know, it's nice to know someone has a heart for you. <laughs> they are the next generation. and. I was touched by St. John's, I learned a lot, and I feel like it's my time to share what I've learned, and I have a heart for the Lord, and I want to pass it along. Yeah, I just got to say before I even start, what an incredible testimony by Taylor, you know, a, a junior in high school who's making a difference in the lives of other kids. She said so many things in there, and I've, I've heard it now three times, and I pick up every time. She said, you know, by teaching these Bible stories to kids, I've learned, and it's brought me so much closer to God myself. That's the way it works, you know, if you teach, you learn. And, and then she said, I noticed that kids can love God as well as a 20-year-old, a 40-year-old, or a 50-year-old. They can, and I'm sure that brings pleasure to God. And then she said, uh, you know, they want to know that somebody loves them. And she said, God has loved me, and I just want to pass it along. What an incredible testimony. I love that she's a product of our ministry, but she hasn't just received. She realizes that in giving, you also receive. Let's pray for our message today. Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all the assembled hearts, what I have to say, but also the focus of those who are gathered to learn, uh, may it honor you and, and may it benefit us uh, that we could be significant in your world, significant in the lives of others and uh, to the sense of, of purposeful life and a fulfilling life as, as long as we have breath, Lord. And, to your glory as well and to the benefit of others, we pray in Christ. Amen. I really don't think that my life is so much different than yours. I, I realize that my title is different. There are few, very few people who do what I do in the congregation. Uh, the details of my day may be different than you, but our lives in the big picture are pretty much the same. We all have activities that we need to do. We all have family issues that we need to deal with. We all have errands that we need to run. We have business that we need to take care of. And, and if you're like me, uh, you print out every week. I print out my calendar and I make a to-do list. People who make a to-do list get uh, incredibly more work done than those who don't work from a to-do list. And so I've learned to do that. And uh, 
you know, I stay busy uh, with all the commitments of my house, my home, my car, uh, the things that I need to provide. And, and in the course of doing that, of course, I interact with people. In fact, the staff will tell you uh, that I'm not a big fan of Mondays. Uh, we start Mondays usually with a one-on-one -on -one at 7 o'clock with somebody on my staff. I meet with them personally, and then we go to 8.15, we have devotions, and then we have development, and then I go to a worship meeting, and Mondays are meeting after meeting after meeting. And I hate meetings because there's a lot of people there, you know, and I, I don't get things done, you know, and as though people aren't important. And, you know, sometimes we get that way. You know, we're so busy with trying to get stuff done that people seem to be like an intrusion into our life. But then it happens, and it always happens. We get interrupted by some event that forces us to put our to-do list aside and go face-to-face -face and heart-to-heart -heart with somebody. In fact, uh, just in our rather small staff, uh, in the past few months, I've, I've had three different people who have come to me and indicated that their uh, teenage daughter who's in college somewhere ha has become pregnant outside of marriage. And I say, well, congratulations, you're going to be a grandpa or a grandma. And, and it doesn't seem like congratulations are in order from their perspective because, you know, that isn't the plan that they had. You know, they're forced to deal with a real issue. I get phone calls about people who are dealing with difficult diagnosis. I was doing a funeral yesterday, and by the time I got off uh, the stage and finished doing that service, there was a, a call waiting for me, uh, somebody that I know, and a personal friend who's in total renal failure, and his wife called and asked if I could come by and visit there. You know, I'm sure that wasn't on their agenda. A friend called to tell me uh, last weekend they were out of town, and they couldn't get back in time, but their son had been taken to the ER with an overdose of prescription medication and alcohol and his life was in danger. You know, it just, it happens. It just life jumps up and smacks you and say, pay attention to people. You know, just set your to-do list aside. Just a few weekends ago, uh, my daughter-in-law had, had taken our precious granddaughter, more precious than her, more precious than my son, uh, up to, uh, <laughs> that's how I feel, just being transparent. You know, up to Iowa to see what she calls her far away grandpa and grandma. So they'd gone up to Iowa to see them. And, and on the way back, her car had shot crap somewhere by the Iowa border. And she was stranded in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of farm country. And, uh, and, and so I got the call, like, okay, I'm supposed to solve this somehow. And, and, and so I grabbed hold of my son. And uh, they caught a ride to the next little town. And we're waiting at a McDonald's. And... You know, it didn't matter what was on my agenda, you know. Life slapped me in the face and said, come deal with somebody that you love. And that's just the way of it. A week ago, uh, uh, my sister calls from Fort Wayne, Indiana, and uh, she said life slapped her around a little bit. She's the uh, head of all hospice care for Allen County, which includes Fort Wayne. Huge, responsible job. Bigger than mine, I'm sure. And uh, she herself had been diagnosed with breast cancer and had a double mastectomy, but she's back at work. So, you know, you really have to deal with that, too, as a brother. You care. But she called me not about herself. She called me about another brother uh, who had lost his job in his 50s, and she was soliciting financial support for him. Hadn't planned on it, but you have to deal with that. You know, babies are being born. People get sick. People die. They get married, they get divorced. Life happens. I used to think that was unusual, you know. As a pastor, I would just step into those circumstances. I can't begin. There's not enough of me to go around to step into all those. You're going to have to do that for each other. You know, that's, that's the way God intended for us. And these are opportunities, different stages for us to be Christ to each other and, and to people that you have a relationship with. It's not unusual. I used to think it was unusual. Everybody has a story like that. You all have stories like that where you're having to deal with personal issues in your life while still managing the detail of your life. Suddenly we realize that people are more important than progress and relationships are more important than your plans to watch a reality TV show that night. Last week I was watching online myself and I heard Pastor Garrett, I think one of the best teachers I have ever heard in my life, and I've heard a few, uh, talking in the last of the series uh, called Freeway, a Not-So-Perfect Guide to Freedom. And he was talking from Isaiah about how the difficulties of our life prepare us, uh, build character in us, and prepare us to do great things in life. 
And as I was listening to him, and, and I do believe he's a great teacher, I thought, why are you putting down Isaiah? Why are you telling people not to ever read the book of Isaiah? Why are you telling people if they suggested in your small group to ask them to leave your small group or to not talk to them anymore? You know, I thought, this is not the Dion I know and love. And, and uh, then about halfway through, he got to the application. I thought, okay, he's ringing my bell now. You know, he's uh, back to making a, a strong point. And, and he's a great teacher. And he, he said, and, and it stuck with me, I'm obviously mentioning it today, he said, you can have a good life by focusing on yourself. Do you remember that? And uh, most of us in West County are capable. You know, we're college educated for the most part. Uh, we're, uh, we're able to read and write. We have jobs for the most part. Uh, we have resources. And, and we can take care of ourselves and we can have a good life. If you want a good life. But if you want a great life, he said, and this was the the thing that really rang my bell. The key to a great life is focusing outward and focusing on others. And man, that is so true. You know, people who move from good to great are people who get it. They write books about people who transform society, who transform even other people's lives. You don't even have to have a book written about you, but you will be great, and this room will be filled. And I had a memorial service yesterday. It was filled because this lady made a difference. In fact, she had died of cancer, but she had developed a blog for herself, and she had been active on social media so that her family is now receiving condolence cards from across the country from complete strangers that she helped. That's a great life. In fact, God is great because the essence of God is to be outwardly focused. It truly is. Uh, I love music. I think we have an outstanding music program here. I just... I love the talent of people who are vocal and people who can play instruments. Just love to watch that, love to experience it. We could have worship without those people, but it would be so much more boring. You know, I appreciate having them here. And uh, one of the great lyrics of recent times that I've grown to love and often quote is that God is great, beer is good, and people are crazy. And uh, I, I just I resonate to that so much. And, and I, I'm a people, I'm crazy too. I, I get that. I'm not just blaming other people. But what's the difference between good and great? God is great because God is outwardly focused. In fact, there's a scripture in Romans chapter 5 that describes this about God. You see, when God made Adam and Eve, just two people, and they messed up, if I'd have been God, I would say, I'm so done with you. You know, I would have, I would have just wiped the slate clean. I mean, come on, God, it was two people. You know, give up two people as opposed to having an entire world for generations and thousands of years live in the consequence of their mistake. If he could have just taken care of it and dealt with that little thing called free will, then the rest of us wouldn't have to deal with all the stuff and all the heartache that we deal with because they messed up. That would have been my approach. But that's not God's approach. God doesn't dismiss you. He doesn't wipe you uh, clean uh, of his mind when you mess up. And he didn't do it with Adam and Eve either. Here's what the Bible says in Romans 5. He says, at the right time, when you needed him most, when you messed up, when you were sin sinful, Christ died for sinners. Rarely would anyone die even for a good person. <laughs> Though for a good person, we could understand how someone would lay down their life. Soldiers do it all the time. Firemen do it. Policemen do it. But God demonstrated his love differently. When you were worthless, when you were a sinner, when you should have been somebody who was dismissed, Christ died for you. It's the nature of God. It's the essence of God to be focused not on himself, not demanding respect, not demanding glory, not demanding homage, not punishing those who don't, but extending himself in love towards those who don't. Now, Jesus was truly God, and I could prove that theologically from the Bible, but you only have to prove it by the way he lived. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul uh, remarked about the nature of Jesus, and he instructed us to have the same attitude. In Philippians 2, he says, In your relationships with one another... You should have a mindset like Jesus had, who though he was in very nature God and could demand and require respect or burn people on the spot, did not consider equality with God something to be demanded. Rather, he made himself nothing. Just the opposite of being great, he made himself a servant. He humbled himself and took upon himself human flesh. And being found in the appearance of a man, that wasn't even enough to be a great man, a great leader. He humbled himself by becoming obedient even to death for you. 
even death of a martyr on a cross. The essence of God is to be outwardly focused. Well, my assignment today is, is to answer the question, so what's holding us back? What's keeping us from being that kind of person who is somebody to someone who needs us? I thought no better way to deal with that than to reference C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screwtape Letters. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a great theologian of the 1940s. He had a radio program in which he broadcast to the soldiers who were fighting World War II across Europe. And it was so popular that eventually it was made into a, a book called Mere Christianity, which is still studied by theologians to this day. Uh, he wrote The Great Divorce, which is a description of, of a man's fall into sin and the change that happened in the world. He wrote The Chronicles of Narnia, you know, the, the, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, and that whole series of books. They've made movies out of them. Uh, the Problem with Pain. And then he wrote The Screwtape Letters. Now, The Screwtape Letters, much to his chagrin, became his most popular work uh, because it was kind of a fanciful description of a senior devil in hell named Screwtape who wrote letters of advice to his young nephew, an apprentice devil named Worm, Wormwood. And he was telling Wormwood how to win more people for hell. And of course, it's all tongue in cheek, and it's helping Christians understand how the devil works and how evil is in the world. And there's one chapter in which he talks about how to destroy churches, because churches are helping people be better Christians, and that's an enemy of the devil. And, and so he gives him advice, and, and his advice deals with the question of what's holding us back What's keeping us from being what God wants us to be? He gives him four words of advice. Number one, get churches complaining. But tell them they're only trying to make things better in their church. But have them complain. The more they complain, the better their church will be. At least convince them of that lie. Secondly, encourage gossip in the church, you know. It's, it's just concern. You're just concerned about people who are messing up. And you just want to pray for them. And so have you heard, you know, we should be concerned. Isn't that incredible what they're doing? And, and gossip, because that helps churches if they're filled with gossip. And so, you know, at least people want to believe that. So encourage that attitude. Uh, number three said, if you want to destroy a church, uh, help them equate being nice to being a Christian. Because if they're just nice, they'll never deal with anything important. They'll never deal with anything that's too upsetting. And their churches will never be uh, very powerful in the hands of God. So help them equate being nice to being Christian, which is, which is not what God would have us be. He'd have us be faithful. And then finally, the one that I want to speak to especially today is keep them busy. Help them believe that doing things is more important than people. Here's, uh, let me just quote him. He says, keep them busy, really busy. It should not be hard, since Christians think the more work they do, the more spiritual they are. The busier they are, the more likely they are to be cranky with each other. So busy they won't have time to talk and care for each other. We can have lots of fun with that, Wormwood. Keep reminding them that tasks are more important than people. Keep them busy. Thus our text for the day from Luke chapter 10. If you have a, a smartphone or a smart device with you, you can just click on live event on the Bible app, and this uh, passage should come up. You can look it up on your phone, or you can look it up in the Bible. From Luke chapter 10, uh, a well-known uh, discussion that Jesus has with a family that he was familiar with, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. They had a home about two miles outside of Jerusalem, just the opposite side of the Kidron Valley. Three times a year, everybody who was Jewish had to come to Jerusalem for festivals. They couldn't all fit in the city, so they would stay in the outlying villages. Jesus and his disciples typically stayed at the home and in the courtyard of Mary and Martha. And uh, this is the family that he uh, has a conversation with in our story today, Luke 10, beginning at verse 38. Now, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to whatever Jesus had to say. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations, by all the hospitality that had to be made to be a proper host. So she came to Jesus, and she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Command her to help me. And Jesus, I'm sure, said this in, in not a judgmental, but a, a gracious voice. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many 
things. But really, only a few things are needed. In fact, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and that will, be not, that will not be taken away from her. I think there's danger here in that we tend to categorize people like, you're a Martha, or you're a Mary, and we would all prefer to be Marys in this story. Uh, but I don't think that Martha was always good, and I don't think that Mary was, uh, or I don't think that Martha was always bad, and Mary was always good. In fact, Mary wouldn't have even had the opportunity to talk with Jesus if Martha had not gone in and invited him uh, into their home. You know, the Marthas of this world make things happen, amen? You know, so I'm gladly a Martha sometimes. She's out there engaged in the world. She's uh, making things happen in society, and she's inviting people. She's showing hospitality. Uh, Mary is more the quiet type, more the reserved type. This isn't the only time that we meet these people, by the way. We also meet them in a famous chapter uh, of John 11, uh, when Lazarus dies. We all know about the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Uh, Jesus knew this family, and when Lazarus, his good friend, became sick, word was sent to him, he was about two days' journey away, was sent to him that your good friend Lazarus is sick, nigh unto death, and they expected Jesus to come running. But if you read the entire chapter, it says Jesus delayed when he heard this news. Delayed. And he said, finally, Lazarus has died. Let us go to him. And they said, well, if he's died, there's no point in really going, is there? He says, I want you to go with me so that you can see the power of God displayed. When he arrived there, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. And as he approaches the city, Martha again runs out to meet him. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to greet him on the road. Mary again stayed in the house. It's her, her nature. Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, she just couldn't keep herself from saying it. If you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. But I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, God can grant you. You know, Martha displayed incredible faith. Uh, it is true that she became distracted, but she in displayed incredible faith. In fact, if it hadn't been for Martha, we would not have that famous passage that I quoted yesterday in my sermon for the funeral when he said, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I have always believed that you are the Christ, the Savior who has promised to come into the world. You know, Martha's are important in this world. She was not a bad person, and you're not a bad person if you get busy and distracted by detail. Martha got distracted is all. It's a short walk from caring to crazy. It really is, you know. Uh, you care, and so you show attention to people, but then you get involved in doing all the activity and you forget that, you know, you've invited people over to get to know them, to have fellowship. You get all stressed out by getting your house ready and by getting the grass cut and the lawn edged. And you're always worried about how things look so that the, the main issue no longer becomes the issue. Life has a way of distracting us. Good people get distracted. This was proven to me recently, uh, in fact, this past week, in, in a couple who is about to get married. We do a lot of weddings here in a big church and a lot of young people involved in our ministry. And, and this is a couple that is actually working and living somewhere else, but they grew up here, and so they want to get married here where all their friends and their family are. And so they're going to be coming back into town in an upcoming weekend, and their marriage is later in the year. And, and so they need to meet with me and with some other staff people who are arranging things uh, for the wedding. But there's a problem. They only have um, uh, time available on, uh, for meetings on Saturday and Sunday. But as it turns out, Saturday isn't going to work uh, because they have to meet with the people who are doing the reception hall. And they have, to, they have to make all those decisions. They have to deal with flowers and they have to have a, a, a gown fitting. And, uh, you know, all the details that are involved, they probably even have to talk to a DJ about the music that they're going to play. I, I don't know. There must be a lot of things that are involved. And, and so could we meet on Sunday? But Sunday isn't going to work so well for me because I work, you know, on Sunday. And, and uh, how about Sunday afternoon? Uh, you know, like right after service. If you'd just be at service, that'd be a good thing. And then I could just talk to you after the service. Well, that's not going to work because we have a bridal shower, you know, in the afternoon on Sunday. So could you make it possible? Could you squeeze us in sometime like Sunday night? I think, so what are you doing here? Are you you're coming to church because you want God's favor? And you got all this other stuff that's crowding out the main thing. You know, we major in minors and we minor in majors. It's just the nature of life. These are not bad people. If you're sitting out here, I'm not trying to put you down here uh, today. You know, it's just the nature of life. It makes me smile. 
to see how quickly unimportant things dominate our schedule and the most important things get pushed aside. The Lord offered a better way in verse uh, 41. He said, uh, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about things, about things. You know, things dominate our to-do list. If you would look at your to-do list, I'll bet you there are more things on there than there are people. More things that need to get accomplished than people that need to be contacted and need to be loved and need to be reached out to. This was not a new teaching for Jesus. In fact, in this very same chapter, just the verses preceding the story that we're studying today, Jesus had a conversation with a religious leader, and this is how it went. An expert on the law stood up to test Jesus. This is just before he went to Bethany and, and came into the home of Mary and Martha. The religious leader stood up to test him and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, I want to be super godly. You know, what would you advise? And Jesus refused to answer the question. He pressed him a little bit because he knew he was asking only to test him. He said, you already know the answer. What is written in the law? How do you read it? And then this guy who was so prideful said, yeah, thanks, teacher, for calling on me. <laughs> he says, here's the answer. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. Love God. Make him priority in your life. And love your neighbor as yourself. How did I do, teacher? And Jesus said, you have answered correctly. The key is do this. Do that, and you will find the key to life. There it is. It's not so hard. You know, faith over frenzy, people over purpose. You know, love God, serve people. That's the answer. It's not difficult. It's just difficult to do. You see, life and the activity is not a bad thing. It's just the stage. It's just the opportunity that you have that's different from mine to do this, to love God and display him in your life and to love people as you interact with people. And what's amazing about this is that you never get fired from this job. You may get fired from your uh, detail job, your money-making job, but that just means that your opportunities change and the people that you interact with will change. And, and you may retire from your job, and, and there are people who retire and say, what am I going to do with your life? I don't know. Love God, serve people. You know, it's just like that. How does that change? Do you not love God anymore? Do you not have people opportunity anymore? This never changes. No matter what your situation in life, you have the opportunity to put faith over frenzy and people over purpose. There's some practical suggestions that I want you to take away. There's only three of them. It's not complicated. Uh, first of all, reset, don't regret. Regret is just lament with no legs. It gets you nowhere. You know, we could kick ourselves for uh, being too focused on detail, too focused on task, but that doesn't change anything. Just, you know, be aware. I don't think anything I'm telling you is so new to you, but we need to relearn it. We need to reset. We need to be reminded that loving God and loving our neighbor is what God wants for us. And if we've gotten, you know, too far adrift from that point of view, then just reset your life and say, you know, today I can reset. I can get it right. Secondly, Prioritize faith over frenzy. It was amusing to me this past week that uh, Victoria Osteen, you know, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, uh, Joel Osteen, uh, the big ministry he has in Houston. Victoria is also a preacher, his wife down there. And she got into a bit of trouble, and it was all over Facebook, because she said, God wants you to be happy in life. And, and don't do what you should do to please God. Do what you should do because it will make you happy. And preachers across the country pounded on her. Bill Cosby was quoted on Facebook, and there's a video of him putting her down, saying how ridiculous that is. And, and, and it's true that there's, you know, it's a bit astray. But there's some truth in what she has to say. You know, faith over frenzy actually brings satisfaction to your life. Now, I don't think that everything that you do in faithfulness will make you happy, but it will make your life significance, which will bring you contentment, which will bring you joy. I don't think joy and happiness are the same thing. 
You know, God has written his book because when you abide by this book, you do find a satisfying life that you would not have otherwise. You can have a good life by focusing on yourself. You can have a great life by being what God would have you be to other people and focusing outward. You know, it is true, even if it leads to martyrdom, even when Paul talked about the fact that he was in prison and could die for preaching the gospel, he said, you know, I'm hard-pressed. That sounds good to me. To die and be with God would be far better than this veil of tears. Oh, but to live on, that means fruitful labor for me too. So he understood that having faith over frenzy is a good thing. And so we need to pour ourselves more into faith. You know, that whole 15 thing, spend 15 minutes a day with the Lord. You know, if people understood this, that the key to life and its greatness is to build faith, our churches would be overflowing because people say, I want a great life and I want to learn more about faith so that I can have the kind of life that God intends for me. Third, place people over progress. This is a lesson that we need to relearn all the time. And, you know, it's, it's no secret that I'm a golfer and I still make the same stupid mistakes as a beginning golfer. Can't tell you how many times I've messed up a shot and said, you looked up. You know, or my grip wasn't right. And I, I know better than that. And I still make the same mistake. I don't swing through the ball. You know, I, I, I think about my swing instead of where I'm hitting the ball. I mean, there's just so many stupid mistakes that you make over and over again. And then I, when I catch myself making the mistake, I say, you have to reset. You have to think about that again. And I think this is a lot of lesson that we have to just keep relearning. We have to prioritize people over progress. We have to prioritize faith over frenzy. And we shouldn't regret the fact that we've gotten astray. We should just reorient and begin that work again. Please stand. I want to pray with you as, as you begin to think about, you know, the difference that you can make in life and the difference that others have made for you. But the best way to prepare ourselves for that is maybe just to recall a couple of scriptures uh, from this week's chapter, Luke chapter 10. Read with me. But a few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. What did Mary choose? She chose to fit, sit at the feet of Jesus and receive from him faith because the one thing needful is faith because faith also, God's essence is outward. Your essence will be outward too if you grow in faith. And then this passage that he said to the religious leader together, he answered, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this. It's the key to life. It's the key to life. It's not difficult. It's the key to life. Faith and focus outward. May God bless you to that end, we pray. Lord, help us to be what you would have us be, uh, certainly to, to your glory and, and because you're God. Uh, but that's not the reason that you want it. You want it because you want us to make a difference in life. And, and you know that when we make a difference in life, we find satisfaction, we find fulfillment, we find a life of purpose. And, and we are hard-pressed like Paul in both directions to die and be with you. Yes, can't wait for that day. But to live on means I can, you know, be outwardly focused. I can make a difference in the lives of children, in the lives of my friends, in the lives of strangers. So, Lord, thank you for purpose in my life. Help me to maintain your priorities as mine. I pray in Christ. Amen.